So I think um, I aspire to be a human scientist, uh, or what you could call a, an anthropologist, or uh, you know, really, I want to study consciousness. And so far as we know, human beings are the, the ones who are, if not uh, the only ones who are conscious, at least the only ones who are aware that they are conscious, and for whom existence is a problem, for whom existence is somehow um, an issue with which concern can be directed. In other words, only the human is aware that they will die. And consequently also only uh, only can human beings love. <clears throat> love unconditionally, meaning beyond the grave or irrespective of the fact of death. You know, the fact that human beings are mortal means that a, a certain kind of love a certain kind of unconditional love becomes uh, a potential for us, a possibility for us that a divine being, that a, an immortal being wouldn't, wouldn't be able to express. Because if you're immortal, you really have nothing to risk by loving. Only human beings have to risk. And I think this is why you know, once you've reached a sort of rational and doic state of consciousness, and you've developed as an individual to that point, which of course is only possible in the larger historical context of the evolution of human consciousness as a species. But we also, you know, ontogenically, we, we recapitulate that phylogenetic history of the whole human race, and we develop to this egoic stage where we are a rational intellect thinking about the world, reasoning about the world. And that's a very important place to have reached, but there's something more, and I think it begins to dawn on, on consciousness that there's something more than the ego when the ego recognizes the way in which others are in fact inside of it. The ego sees that it is open to others and radically transparent to others because of the simple developmental fact that I become aware of myself through your eyes, through the eyes of the other. I learn to be self-conscious by interacting with the faces of others and learning to hear and to speak the language of others. Only through that gift from the outside can I become a conscious, moral, creative, free human being. Um, maybe I'll, I'll give you a, a little taste of this book that I'm reading by a Christopher Bamford called An Endless Trace, The Passionate Pursuit of Wisdom in the West. Um, and uh, it's basically about the, the hermetic uh, tradition, um, the sort of idea that nature is an evolving system becoming art through uh, the development of, of human creativity. So that the universe is itself um, an anthropogenic event. The cosmos is an anthropocosmos, an anthropocosmogenesis, as Teilhard de Chardin would put it. Which, you know, obviously it puts human beings right at the center of the meaning of existence, and so it can make it seem, uh, I don't know, a bit grandiose, a bit... Uh, self-involved, or at the very least anthropocentric, um, or, or an anthro anthropomorphism in the sense that it's making it, making the universe out to seem um, 
as if it revolves around the human being when, when it doesn't. But I think there's a there's a subtler point that, that should be made, which is the Kantian point, the Kantian problem that it was raised by the critical response to the metaphysical systems of rationalism and you know to the re reductionistic systems of human empiricism. And that response is that, well, human consciousness knows the world through its own categories, and those categories are um, logically related to one another. And then, you know, from there, you have to leave Kant and, and go into Fichte and Schelling and Hegel. But the idea that, that really, you know, if we can think of this in terms of, of the Copernican, by analogy to the Copernican shift in astronomy, um, the Kantian shift forced us into the epistemic position of realizing that the, the mind constantly um, is at the center and that the world revolves around it as if it were the sun because the order of the world shines out from within before we ever experience anything from without. It shines out from within our mind. And so our sensory intuitions and our uh, categories of understanding have already filtered the world. And in fact, we can, we can know these categories of understanding. We can be conscious of them. You know, Kant wouldn't allow us to be conscious of the self, which is conscious of the categories. Because that would be God. And Kant thought that while we were I mean, there's an esoteric side to Kant. He was um, an avid reader, and uh, you know, he was critical of um, of uh, what's his name, Swedenborg, in, uh, in some early lectures. But Kant also thought that the many of the speculations or the experiences that uh, that uh, he was reporting that. Um, Swedenborg was reporting, uh, in fact, were depictions of what the rich life that uh, awaits the soul after death and, and had um, been a part of our experience before birth. Uh, so Kant was, you know, trying to leave room for, for super sensible experience, but he just didn't believe we could have it while still embodied um, on earth. I think Schelling and Hegel and you know, romantic poetry, or perhaps an as yet undeveloped uh, or at least unmatured synthesis of poetry and philosophy uh, allows us to um, see the spirit in the flesh or the mind in the matter, eternity in history. Uh, <clears throat> I want to read the first paragraph uh, from Banford's second chapter called Our Daily Bread. And then uh, I think I'll sign off. Our experience in the world of visible nature is always paradoxical. Born with the intuition of unity, of the singleness of the universe, we find ourselves divided and confused by the discovery that we are distinct from the world. As soon as seamless reality splits into outside and inside, the first, the outside, obscures the second, the inside, while the second hides behind the first, the inside hides behind the outside. The realization that unless these two splits of our interpreted world become one, we cannot, in Rilke's words, become reliably at home in our interpreted world. The realization of this fact comes only later and marks the first stage of spiritual awakening. The initiatory path of transformation, the work of esotericism, is the movement from outer to inner. It is the way of love. 
by which two are made one. Many traditions begin the path with the contemplation of death, which is all around us. Living in transient outer nature, we do not seem wholly to belong to her. Ambiguity masks our relationship with what surrounds us. We find ourselves tragically cut off and alien. Nature sustains us. Our body is assembled from her elements and maintained according to her laws, but she is indifferent to us. When we die, the innocent necessity of her laws takes over our body, reducing it to dust. Yet the elements that make up the body are never destroyed and would seem to live on forever. In that sense, as children of physics and chemistry, we are immortal and nature is our place. But insofar as we aspire to the freedom of self-knowledge, nature's mother womb seems a prison or a trap. Well, it gets better, but you'll have to read it yourself. <laughs>